All right, well, thank you, Regina, for, uh, for having us and hosting us and for the kind words. Um, before I get started, I'll do a quick presentation, uh, but just to give you a sense of my background. Uh, I graduated in May from the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania, and before that, I worked in management consulting at BCG and in private equity. I graduated from Brown University, grew up in Los Angeles, and I now live in New York. Uh, I'll try and take a very short 10 minutes to just give you a little bit of background on our organization, the Wharton 22s, uh, and hopefully that will lead to a rich discussion uh, between, all, between all of us and all of you. So who are the Wharton 22s? As Regina mentioned, we are a student-led group of Wharton MBAs. Our membership is all male, and we work in close concert with the Wharton Women in Business Association, or WIB, who are uh, women, uh, Wharton's premier women's affinity group. Because it always comes up, I'll tackle it early, the name. <laughs> Our name, the Wharton 22s, is a tongue-in-cheek reference to the current pay gap between men and women in America. The, average, the median woman makes 22% less than the median man. And yes, it is a little bit of a weird name. I won't take credit for it myself. And it's not the only issue that we concern ourselves with but it is a great opportunity for us to start a dialogue about gender issues uh, when we introduce ourselves to a new audience. Um, we have 34 male officers and 320 pledge supporters. And when we talk about pledge supporters, this is the pledge that we're referring to. I'll let you all read it for yourself, but essentially it boils down to three basic commitments we ask of men at Wharton. And that's a commitment to support gender equity efforts around us, a commitment to understand our own role and our own actions, and a commitment to connect, connect productively with others. And through our efforts to date, the 320 male, rep uh, male pledge pledgees of the 22s represent about one third of all men at Wharton. We the 22s hope to see a more equitable world with respect to gender issues, and we recognize that the business community plays a vital role in shaping that. Unfortunately, there's still a lot of progress yet to be done. Recognizing both that men are frequently the sources of gender inequity and that many parts of the business world are currently disproportionately male, we feel that male-led uh, male activism can be an effective complement to the efforts of our female counterparts. This is an idea, frankly, that we can't take credit for. The Warden 22 was initially founded um, with the support of WIB, who saw this as an area for growth and engagement and sought out a group of male leaders on campus to help foster these efforts. That said, our ethos is one of recognizing that privilege, and in our case, male privilege, imposes more obligations. As men, we inhabit spheres where women may be absent or underrepresented. And as men, we have opportunities to engage men who may be resistant to women's voices. Lastly, as men, we often benefit from an unequal status quo. And for those of us who are involved in the 22s, uh, we recognize an obligation to help change that status quo. So that's a very high level overview of who we are as the 22s, but why are we relevant for a company like Google? I would argue that the challenges that we faced in forming, organizing, sustaining our organization are actually very similar to the ones that you would face at Google, or frankly, at any large organization. And because of that, our experiences can be valuable for the community here as you think through whether this is a strategy you want to pursue, and if so, how you might go about doing it. There are five specific areas that I would highlight quickly, um, which we've grappled with in building the 22s, and I'm going to cover them pretty quickly, uh, but hopefully we can continue to build on, on some of these during our discussion. So first is the existential question of representation. Um, what does it mean to be a male ally? What does it mean to be an ally? And what's the role of, women, of men in a, a conversation that primarily affects women? How do we stand up for the issues that uh, we believe need change without drowning out the voices of women who, um, who have been active in the discussion for so long? I think this is really important for us and for the men in attendance. If you leave here with one thing, I would say remember this. Uh, our view is that being an ally requires humility, empathy, and courage, but humility first of all. 
And that's the humility to, rep to understand that you don't have the same lived experience of your female allies. And rather than viewing yourself as a change agent who has all the answers, instead see your mission as one to listen, to understand, and to support. I think, you know, just to, to reiterate one thing, which is in the business community, and I think particularly in technology, there's an attitude that uh, coming with a solution first, being willing to move fast and, and break things, is the solution to all situations. And I think that often uh, we forget that uh, in social issues, sometimes listening, taking a step back, admitting what we don't know, and being willing to be wrong and being willing to be vulnerable can be even more impactful. Second, and more practically, the question of recruitment. How do you get men to care about this issue? Who should be part of an ally group? We take a multi-pronged approach here to the work that we do. And we try to appeal to men uh, on multiple levels, ranging from the pure ethical, the purely ethical, to the more self-interested. Some of the things we emphasize at Warden are uh, the ability to be an inclusive leader and collaborator in teams. I think there was an era where the idea of being a global manager was new to the business school curriculum. And where we are today, I see the view of being an inclusive leader at the forefront of what it means to be a successful manager. Uh, additionally, we like to emphasize that these are not purely women's issues that we talk about. Family leave policies can affect both men and women in the workplace. And we also address questions of work-life balance for men. Uh, the question of what does it mean to be an active father? How do you address issues of masculinity? Uh, and then lastly, it's obviously the right thing to do. And I think most people's hearts are in the right place. And we hope to help equip them with better tools uh, to be that change they want to see in the world. Third, programming. What do we actually do as a male ally group? And what tangible measures do we take? We have a basic framework for how we try to engage with our audience at Wharton, and that includes awareness, dialogue, and activism. For each of these, we try to develop programming uh, relevant for, for folks at Wharton to first, to build their awareness that gender inequities still exist and what those are, to foster dialogue, to help them connect with their peers and to listen to the experiences of their female counterparts, and to empower them to be effective advocates for change in the environments they go into. Uh, in terms of awareness, we publish articles in the Warren Journal. We invite speakers to campus. We employ social media campaigns to raise awareness of various uh, gender issues. And we have lunch lecture series so people can feel educated about the topics uh, that, that we discuss. To foster dialogue, we host candid dinner discussion series where people can have a sp safe space to engage on these topics and feel that they have a forum within the business school community and within the professional environment to talk about these types of issues. And we host workshops to help people understand uh, the various ways that intersectionality can play into this mission as well. And lastly, uh, in terms of activism, the first step we have is having the existence of the 22s in our officer board so that men who are interested in the subject can get more involved and progressively continue to, to get involved in the issue of gender equity. And secondly, we have intensive workshops uh, where we work on empowering MBA candidates with the tools to make change and intervene when they return to the real world and their professional lives. Fourth, the topic of discomfort. How do you manage the awkward and often threatening feelings that can come with engaging on a touchy subject? All of our work hopes to create a climate where folks feel safe discussing these issues, empowered to ask questions, uh, and comfortable being vulnerable. But I think the biggest impact that we've had in creating this type of an outcome at Wharton is by existing as a group, by setting an example that this is an appropriate conversation topic, by acting as role models for other men who might want to engage on the topic, and creating a critical mass uh, that shows the outside world that this is a topic of interest to young business leaders. And lastly, what's the best structure for a group like this? How do you continue to sustain an organization like this, particularly in a business school environment where we have 50% annual turnover? I think today, these are probably the areas where we have the most to grow. Um, but luckily, being in business school, we have a lot of opportunities to experiment and try and get the model right. I know 10 minutes probably isn't enough time to familiarize you with everything that we've done and all the thinking that we've done about the issue of being a male ally group. But hopefully, this gives you a little bit of a taste for our work, how we think about our mission, 
um, and leads to a good conversation. So with that, I'll thank you for hosting us today. Uh, it's really a pleasure to have the opportunity to share our efforts with such a large audience. And if I forget to make the plug again later, I'll direct you all to learn more about us at our website, <laughs> www.warden22s.com. And just to build on Regina's earlier story, we'd been saying for a long time we needed a website. But when I got a Facebook message from Regina saying that she'd heard us on the radio, uh, it dawned on me and our head of marketing that we really needed a little bit more of an official way to get in touch with us. <laughs> so we can credit Regina with the creation of our website. <laughs> All right, thank you. My name is Ashley Wells. I, like Lazo, recently graduated from Wharton in May. Uh, I was at Deloitte Consulting in DC for four years before school. And fun fact, uh, I did my MBA internship at Google last summer. So I had Noogler training in this room. And it feels very familiar and exciting to be back with you guys. So thanks so much for having Wharton here represented at Google. Awesome. Thank you for joining us. Ken, you want to introduce yourself to the half the room you may oh, not know? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Ken Katesha, I've been here now 18 months, and I'm responsible for uh, a group called BizApps uh, that does everything from what we do engineering for GVC through to what we do with DevOps. Great to be here. Perfect. My name is Eric Young. I joined Google six months ago. Uh, so I guess I'm no longer a Noogler, uh, but super <laughs> excited to be here today. Um, I run a team called Supply Chain Systems. I'm one of Ken's peers. So uh, perhaps I'll start with the first question. Um, one of the unique things you did was forming a male allies group. Um, can you tell us more about um, why you think it's so important and critical to bring men into the conversation? Uh, what do you hope to gain by, by their engagement and involvement? Yeah. Um, I think I touched on it earlier, but for us, you know, there's a recognition that uh, the, it, it's not solely the role of those who are disadvantaged by the status quo to seek change. That, uh, that those in a position of privilege have a opportunity and also a moral responsibility to be a part of that change. And I think the practical matter is, in the business world, there are a lot of environments where women are absent or underrepresented. And so uh, it's incumbent on us to use our position in those, in those spheres to be an agent of change. And frankly, as men, to also educate ourselves uh, about what issues are faced by our peers and to look internally to see what part of, you know, what part of the situation we play a role in. In, interesting that you've chosen the Walton 22's group, and how did you think about perhaps augmenting or being a, a kind of a joint force with the um, you know Walton women in business group? So is that what people like, hey, then that's inclusive. It's a it's a joint force. So just help us understand why it was important to have this this kind of uh, parallel initiative here. Yeah, so I think there, there's a few things we, we took into consideration. I'd say, first off, you know, we work very closely in concert with WIB. Um, and so we don't operate 100% independently. I think we communicate, you know, Ash and I certainly communicated a lot. And, and with Ashley's co-presidents, you know, we communicate a lot about what efforts we're focusing on, getting buy-in, making sure that we're on the right track. But in terms of how we specifically target and engage men, I think our mission is slightly different from, from that of WIB. And I'll let you talk about you know, what WIB does more broadly. But I think for us, the question is more squarely about gender inequity, uh, and particularly about what men can do about that. And so um, one that's looking at um, educating men about things that maybe haven't been a part of their consciousness, and so creating content for that. And that's a unique experience, because I think for, for women, this is something that they've faced every day of their life and every day of their professional career. Uh, for men, this may be a new topic. And so the approach is different. I think secondarily, uh, there are issues that are specific to men that, that are of interest to them um, around you know, what type of father do you want to be? How are you going to balance that with your career? How do family leave policies affect you? And I think by having an independent group, we're able to focus on curating content for that audience directly. Yeah, um, absolutely. And I think that one thing that's really important, um, and I'll, I'll speak directly to, to the men in the group, is something that was really special about the Wharton 22s is that it is really uh, a male initiative that's run by men. It is not Wharton Women in Business. like telling the men what to do uh, or, or how to run their organization. And that was really important to us from the beginning, was that this is something that men took initiative on and led. Um, 
in partnership uh, with one another. Um, the only other thing I'll say in terms of uh, Wharton Women in Business specific programming, I think that there will always be a very important space for organizations that you know, you're a part of days like today where women have time with just women to connect on a lot of the issues that are important to us and we need that safe space uh, among women. At the same time, I think there are so many men that say, tell me what to do, or how do I get involved with this, or this is a conversation that I want to be a part of as well. And so having an organization or a male allies group such as the 22s is that forum for so many men that want to be a part of the conversation. Great. Great. Perfect. Um, so gender diversity, as you kind of touched on, can be a tough topic for many. Um, people often don't know how to engage in the, the conversation. I think some of us may have seen the Grace Hopper's conference that had a male allies panel that went sideways. Um, others of us may have saw it firsthand, some read about it. Um, what advice would you give to the men in the room who are looking to get involved um, in terms of overcoming some of the fears and the ways to engage effectively with the group? Yeah. Um, I think it goes back to really thinking about you know, what the role of an ally is and being willing to listen. Um, you know, I'd say the first thing is to recognize that you don't have all the answers, that you don't have the same shared experience. And so to, you know, if, this, if gender is an issue you want to engage with, ask questions of, of the women in your life, the women you're close to, uh, be open to hear the feedback that they give you, uh, and consider how you can make positive change, but, but look for that direction. Be willing to be vulnerable about what you don't know. Uh, be willing to ask questions, and be, I think be willing to fail also. You know? Be open to being called out, be open to being wrong, be open to putting your foot in your mouth and making sure that you clearly communicate this is something that you're interested in, that you're engaged in, that you're trying to be better about, and you'll find partners along the way. I think you know, if we look at the membership of the, the officers of the 22s, you know, we certainly have folks who have been involved in gender issues and social justice issues before. We also have folks who have come to us and said, you know, this is something I want to learn about. This is a weakness of mine, and that's why I'm joining. Uh, you know, I think of one particular member of ours who, you know, he comes from a background in the military and special ops. He had never worked with a woman before in his entire life. Uh, he's coming into business school. He has two young daughters. And he said, listen, I recognize that I don't even know what I don't know. I want to be a part of this, and, and this is going to be an initiative for me to grow. And so I think about that example as someone raising their hand and saying, I'm willing to fail. But I'm willing to. But I'm also ready to listen, uh, rather than proffer a solution. I think one of the great things you uh, shared with me just last week in our conversation was the advice to speak with and not speak for. I thought mm -hmm. that was particularly powerful, and I thought it was a, a good takeaway overall. And the willingness, as you say, to make yourself vulnerable, be willing to make mistakes. Um, you know, people are there to be supportive and work through it. Yeah, right. I, I would add my own comments to that. As we talk about gender inequality or diversity. Um, you know, this is something that I think is important to all of you. I, you know, Ashley, I'll echo what you said as well, which is, you know, if you, t if you look at how technology specifically is shaping everything that we do, and, and as females as 51% of the population, 20% representation in tech, it rep represents like a, such a huge opportunity mm. to influence every aspect of our, our society and, and the economy. Okay. And I think if we don't, you know, not addressing it, I think is, um, it, 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 it's catastrophic in many ways. But the, the, it is uncomfortable. So when, I know when I'm writing an email, whether it's about gender inequality or about diversity in the workplace or civility in the workplace, you know, I, I, I have a lot of help, but I spend a lot of time almost dissecting every word. Because yeah. I'm really worried that I'm going to offend somebody. You know, do I use, do I use the, the, the black community? Or how do I describe people? How do I? And, and it's interesting to, for you to hit, say, you know, be prepared to fail. That's very hard to do. Because you're actually worried that, OK, did I, did I inadvertently offend somebody? And then how do you even, I don't know whether you've had the experience of how do you recover from something like that? Yeah. You know, I, I don't, I, it, it's, it's hard. That, that's yeah. very hard. So going back to the, the presence of psychological safety in the workplace, it also needs to be a safe space for managers to sometimes make mistakes. And as a manager or a leader, it's your responsibility to communicate to your teams, look, I'm open to feedback, all kinds of feedback, and that feedback can include difficult topics. Yeah. And I want you to come to me if there's ever a time when you've experienced 
discomfort or a, a time when maybe I could have been more sensitive or more inclusive, I want you to bring that to me. And I, I think that says, uh, speak so much to just your confidence as a leader um, and also uh, your, your competence, frankly, in, in leading an inclusive team. Yeah. I think also, you know, em empathy plays a large role because, um, yes, it's, it's always going to be difficult to put yourself at risk. It, it's always going to be a question about what's, what's expected of me and what's the right action. But if you start with empathy and thinking about, okay, let me put myself in someone else's shoes. Um, I think that often helps to clarify things. Um, it's not a, it's not a cure-all. It certainly doesn't work in every situation, and, and sometimes it's difficult to adequately imagine what someone else feels. But starting from that perspective, I think, can help um, help you understand what you should be watching for and, and start to look in the mirror uh, right. from outside of yourself. Obviously, personal discomfort is one of the key reasons that um, perhaps men don't engage in the conversation. What are the other hurdles you see about getting more engagement uh, in the conversation and in the dialogue? Yeah, I think the biggest one we face is apathy. Um, I think you know at Warden, I imagine at a place like Google, you encounter very few people who are actively antagonistic who say, "I don't like this. I don't. I don't want gender equality. I don't want gender equity." Um, I think the the question is more. Why, why does this affect me? Why, why is this my problem? Why do I care? Um, and so I think that is one of the, the main reasons, you know, as 22s, it's important for us, I think, as men to model the behavior of being engaged, of caring, and of being comfortable talking about some of these issues and how it affects us. Um, and so that's, you know, how do you get people in the door is, is a sort of tactical challenge. You know, what type of programming is interesting? How do you market events? How do you invite people to be part of the discussion? Um, and there's a lot of ways to do that. But I think the, the core challenge is just, how do you engage people? Um, and, and I think often that's bringing it home for them. Uh, you know, sometimes we talk about, you know, no matter who you are as a man, there are women in your life who you care about, and if you are open to listening to what they experience, it's hard not to have empathy. And whether that's a female colleague, a female manager, a mentor, a family member, a daughter, um, that's often a starting point for, I think, a lot of men to recognize that they care in some respect. Let me go a little bit deeper and ask questions and listen. And I think that's a snowball effect. As you start to become more open to engaging, you find more reasons why it's important to you for your personal ethics, for how it affects you and your family structure, um, whatever that may be. I think it's a great point you hit on, both in terms of awareness, um, unconscious bias is something we offer here at Google to teach all Nooglers, when that's part of their onboarding, kind of the, the reality that unconscious bias exists. I, I personally remember taking that for the first time before joining Google at Grace Hopper's conference last year, and I remember thinking in the room, like, I can outsmart the test, like, I can, <laughs> I can do well, like, the, I, I'm sure, like, this is not going to surface anything, but it was super real to watch the room kind of go through this kind of experience and see just how much and how reality this really is a situation and an uh, opportunity to address. And I think a lot of people walked away from that with a new appreciation about the importance um, to, to make a focused effort here. I've got, I've got one other question, sure. if I might. Um, Leslie, you, you touched upon not having all the answers uh, and the importance of listening, which I think I, I, nobody would disagree with. Lately, um, in some of the conversations I'm having, I think people want a sense of actions. Let's do something about it. You know, if we don't do something about it, the, in this industry in 20 years' time is going to look very much like it does today. Mm. And in fact, if you look over the last 20 years, very unfortunately, very little has changed. There seem, we were just talking about this earlier. That there seems to be this magic 20% number, 20% mm. of uh, females in Congress, 20, roughly 20% of females in technology. You know, that, that we seem to be stuck here. So, you know, in, in, your, in your experience and this journey, when is the transition point from going from, hey, I'm, I'm listening, I kind of get it, I'm addressing my own biases to some of the actions that you've seen be successful around changing the narrative uh, and, and uh, really making that, the kind of impact that we'd all like to see with gender equality and, and I think other issues of diversity? I mean, I think that's, that's certainly the challenge, right, is, is how to get, get over that hump. And, and we probably don't have the answer for that. I think our perspective is, uh, the best way to get there to whatever the, the specific situation is, the best way to get to effective action only comes once you've had 
real discourse and, a, and an inclusive discourse um, and one where people are willing to go beyond um, you know, sort of putting, putting a bright face on things. And so that's you know, where we focus is getting men into that discussion and sort of opening their minds and, and opening their ears to, to hearing a different perspective. Um, so I think you know, that, that's where we've traditionally focused. But unless you have that raw, honest discourse and inclusive discourse, it's hard to have a sustainable solution, I think. I think there was a great quote that was shared with me that kind of summarizes both the points, which is, the standard you walk past is the standard you accept. And I think that was a very powerful quote to me. I think it, there's a lot of small things that we can each do in our everyday kind of interactions, and it's those small things. It's the, the cumulative efforts of many people engaging and actually um, speaking up, recognizing both the supportive work that's being done as well as providing feedback, assuming best intent, but providing feedback so that we can all uh, kind of hone our communication or uh, perform better. So certainly want to um, recognize that. If you see something, definitely take a moment to recognize it. I want to thank our panelists for their time today. Really appreciate all the time and discussion. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.